again to Romans, Romans 4, we can read again verses 20 and 21, Romans chapter 4, and at verse 20, no unbelief made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. It's clear from the, the chapter that um, Paul is arguing that uh, justification or having all of our sins forgiven and being accepted as righteous by God, he's illustrating that from the situation that Abraham had. And the first thing that maybe strikes you, you've maybe noticed already, or it's maybe something you've thought about, is that we often think rightly that Justification is a state into which we come or brought by God immediately upon believing. And uh, a check later, if you, if you wish, on the unbeatable catechism will show the order and the things that take place. Justification, it's, it's um, as a result of embracing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Something we were not uh, conscious of happening to us is not something that that um, happens in us. It's not something that comes within our experience, though some of the blessings of justification do. But none of us knows the time at which that happens. The argument that Paul's bringing before us in Romans 4 might confuse things a bit, because this the reference here in, in um, Romans 4, taking us back to Genesis 15, isn't the first time Abraham believed or is said to have believed which means it couldn't have been the time of his justification. We know from Hebrews 11 that by faith Abraham, when he was called to inherit a, pla to, to, to inherit a place, um, to seek and, and sojourn in a place he'd afterwards received an inheritance, he went out, we're told, not knowing where he was going. By faith he went out. And so he was a believer at this point. And so I think it shows us that Paul isn't saying this is the point. Genesis 15 isn't the point in Abraham's life when he became a justified man. But that the faith he's showing is the faith of a justified man or woman. He's showing these characteristics and he's showing these, um, the realities that he feels on the inside that's making him completely, implicitly, and totally Forsake all self-reliance and trust completely in what God is saying to him. The promise is in Genesis 15, it maybe sounds a bit confusing to us because we're thinking now in terms of being justified, as we'll read in just a moment from Galatians 3, justified by faith in Christ. We go back to Genesis 15 and maybe wonder, where's that in Abraham's life? Where is the truth that we know? Well, we read in Genesis 15, do we know about God promising after Abraham's met Melchizedek, the Lord appears to him and says, fear not, I'm your shield, your great reward. But Abraham argue, he, he, he does, he reasons with God. And um, God is promising blessing and he's saying, thank you, but I'm, I haven't got an heir. So this is the main thing, Lord, he's saying. And the only one is Damascus, um, is the Eliezer of Damascus, the servant of my house. And God is saying, no, your very own son will be your heir. Then God takes him outside, says, look toward heaven, number the stars if you're able to. Then he said, so shall your offspring be. And then we're told, and he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. The first thing that can be confusing is we maybe wonder if this is the time when Abraham was justified, and we're trying to say it cannot be. The second thing that's maybe confusing, it sounds that while works are being excluded from contributing any, in any way towards acceptance with God, it almost sounds like faith is that which justifies, or that faith is the actual righteousness. Well, we were told in verse 3 of... Gen uh, of um, Quoting from Genesis, we're going to verse, verse 3 of chapter 4 of Romans. What does the scripture say? 
Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. As though it's his faith that's counted to him as righteousness. But that, of course, cannot be the case. Because if that was the case, if that was what was being said, the rest of the chapter makes no sense. And it's possible to maybe try and pin down absolutely everything. Even, the, uh, it can be quite challenging, even with the interpretation sometimes New Testament writers give of the Old Testament, like thinking um, recently about Psalm 2 in, in the book of Acts. It doesn't seem to, because we maybe come to it with uh, the, the passage with our with, with what we, we believe or maybe um, what we think it means. And then when we read it in its context, it just doesn't seem to, to make sense. And, and that's part of the joy, is it not, of, of searching the scriptures and discovering new angles on things anyway. Because uh, what, what Paul's real burden is, is showing in chapter 1 the Gentile world, the whole Gentile world is condemned. Chapter 2 the whole Jewish world is condemned. Chapter 3, the whole world combined is condemned. And then chapter 4, he's saying, well, what about Abraham? What, 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 did, what does he say in the beginning of the chapter? What, what, what then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Because someone's maybe anticipating this. Someone's maybe thinking that somewhere Abraham is, or the Old Testament way, including Abraham, is viewed as cont contributing something, of doing something, of earning. He's saying if that is the case, verse 4 is showing the one who works, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. You can see that where his logic is going. Abraham did not earn that standing. His faith did not earn that standing. His believing the promises of God wasn't the basis for his righteousness, nor was it the actual righteousness. Faith was the gift that God gave him, the enabling to embrace everything God was saying to him and to embrace it unconditionally. I mean, Abraham was faced with impossibilities just now. That This is part of it. And, and I think what, rather than Paul defining justifying faith, You'll see chapter 5, he goes on and explains and expands a bit more on these things. But there's more as well. We'll read them in Galatians. But the, the, he's making it very, very clear that while the Old Testament may be viewed by some as being more based on works and ceremonies and sacrifices and all of these things, they weren't ever, as Hebrews shows us, intended to be or meant to be viewed as being an end in themselves. They were all shadows, they were all types, all the sacrifices, the rituals, the priesthood. The whole lot was prefiguring something that Christ was going to, and as Hebrew shows, did actually fulfill. And so the Old Testament, the way they were saved from Adam right through, is the same way we are saved, by faith. And it's faith that we receive. It's faith that, you remember that it's in, uh, in John 3. I mean, these things are maybe spelled out definitively. In, in a kind of compartmentalized way. But we know from the Bible that faith is sometimes described as sight and sometimes described as entering or, or walking. John 3, our Lord says to Nicodemus, unless someone is born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless someone is born again, they cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's a transition and it involves a transformation we begin to see things we never saw, and we find ourselves in a place we never used to be in. And it's the kingdom of God and these unseen, these spiritual realities. But when, when we're brought to that place, we're being brought the same place Abraham was brought to. The basis on which his faith uh, was to rest was the same as yours and mine. We are trusting in Christ. And we are resting in his finished work. But it's insofar as that's been revealed to us in the Bible, isn't it? We're looking back and we're holding on by faith to what Abraham was looking forward to and hold, holding on to by faith. It's amazing. This. Just, just to maybe give, it's a wonderful how the, how the Bible explains itself. In Galatians 3, 
Because you look back and see the promise Abraham was given in Genesis 15 was to descendants as numerous as the stars above. But there'd be one special descendant God was gradually telling Abraham in his journey of faith. One special descendant, and he gradually made it clear that it was going, that, that Sarah was going to be uh, this, this, this boy's mother. It wasn't going to be through Hagar. And so it's gradually God was revealing these things, but revealing in the word, you're going to possess the land. You're going to have a, innumerable descendants. And there's going to be a special descendant through whom all the nations of the world will be blessed. We try piecing that together sometimes. See what Galatians 3 says. Paul is saying to the foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. He's saying, he's, they're going back to the works of the law. And he's saying this, let me ask you this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you work miracles among you through the works of the law or hearing of faith? And then here it is. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, then know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. This is it. And the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So when God is promising that, this, that, that through him all the nations of the world will be blessed, God is preaching the gospel to Abraham. And we may, reading Genesis, maybe struggle to see the light of that. But the, the amount of disclosure God was giving with these progressive and these gradual revelations is phenomenal. You wonder sometimes about the effect. You know the effect that we, when we're praying tonight and you know, when the Lord speaks to you and, and even one word sometimes. But the thought of receiving direct revelation from heaven and the accompanying wonder and astonishment. Saying that because of a bit further forward in Abraham's life when Mount Moriah with Isaac where the Lord commenting on that, you remember he says that your, your father Abraham, he rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And the reference our Lord is making is to Mount Moriah. And what's amazing is he was there himself, the angel of the Lord. He's the one who spoke and prevented and made sure that Abraham did not fulfill what he was going to do in, in sacrificing his son. It's all very thought-provoking. The one who was with Moses on the, in the burning bush and on Mount Sinai is the one who was with Abraham on Mount Moriah. And the one who, when Abraham had the faith to respond, the, the, the Lord will provide. And the mount of the Lord it will be seen. It's the very place the temple was going to be built. Abraham saw it, Jesus said. He rejoiced to see it. He saw the ram being substituted for Isaac. He saw that this was the place of sacrifice. He could see Calvary somehow. And we maybe struggle in Genesis 15 to see, how could Paul be talking about being justified by faith? Where's the promise of descendants making any connection with Jesus as Savior and living a perfect substitutionary life? Well, Abraham saw it. So we're trying to remind ourselves of the astonishment, we maybe think, well, they didn't maybe know as much as, well, we don't, I don't mean that, that sounds wrong, um, because it's not, it's not the case that we think we knew more than Abraham, but what, by not having the completed Bible, I mean, you know, in the sense that we, with the New Testament, not only have we only got the first four, uh, the first five books of the New Testament, the histories, but you have the letters to explain them. But God was revealing things very powerfully to the like of Abraham. Very powerfully. You know, you know, sometimes to be able to live everyday life with having certain things revealed to you from heaven must be very difficult. And largely in the sense that when God is doing that, it's very often with an impossible situation he's presenting you with. We were praying there about the Valley of Bones, Ezekiel 37. 
And God's presenting the prophet with an impossible situation. And he asks him the question, son of man, can these bones live? You know, what are you going to say to God? Well, what does he say? He says, Lord, you know. And the, the, out, the outcome is there. The impossibility of Abraham's situation was his own body and his wife's body. God is saying, your own, you will have your own son. And as, as the progression and, and, and reading Abraham's life, you'll see there's a gradual. It's not that God said to, to Abraham or explained that uh, Sarah would be the mother of who becomes Isaac. That, and there's a sense we, she was wrong to do, every, you know, and, and the way the situation transpired with Hagar and, and trying to find the son of promise that way. But she didn't have, there was, the, the Lord hadn't told them. You'd expect it to be obvious, though. And then, well, let's not be critical. We don't, you know, to stand in people's shoes and the desperation of what's going on, but trying to help without realizing it, trying to help God fulfill his promises, trying to help him rather than waiting where, where this faith is a complete waiting. There's blessedness, Paul is saying. There's blessedness involved with Abraham. He quotes from Psalm 32, and he highlights these aspects of justification. And he's saying David was talking about justification. And some people say that in the, people in the Old Testament, they were saved a different way. And because there's no reference to well, one example is some will say that um, the Lord's teaching about when he's talking about the, the coming of the Holy Spirit. He said, uh, yes, and what the, what the Lord says about that, he says these things of the Spirit because the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus had not yet been glorified, uh, meaning Pentecost, and meaning the way the Spirit was going to come on Pentecost in fulfillment of Joel 2, as Peter makes the case in that chapter. The Spirit of God was very, very real, very, very present. It's a wonderful study. B.B. Warfield has done a study, the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. It's a phenomenal study. And uh, you think just one example being the life of Samson. And you can see the references, the life of David, the Psalms. There's so many. But when it, when it becomes more complicated and kind of theological, you find that in Paul. He says, Psalm 32 is talking about justification. And he's also saying the word of the Lord to Abraham is justification. And we think of a man looking for the inheritance of the land and the descendants and the promised seed. And Paul is saying, but at the same time, he understood forgiveness of his own sins. He understood the gospel. He realized and he appreciated that what he had to do was completely relinquish everything that he is and had to God. How does that connect with us when we're separated by the centuries? He was looking forward to a promise to be fulfilled and the one who would fulfill the promises, what I thought, was revealing the promises to him gradually. He has an amazing, he was called the friend of God. No wonder. The Lord speaking to him about these things. We are saved in the, in this, in the way of looking back on the promises that have been fulfilled. The Lord said, it is finished. How does this, and this is where we want to think just, just a minute minute or two, um, is the fact that when we think about faith, sometimes to think about justification, you think of it's maybe one kind of faith that you, build, that you initially believe in. The example, well, not everyone has the crisis experience, but remember the, jail, the jailer in Philippi and how he asks what, what he has to do, what must I do to be saved? So he's under that, clearly under a conviction of sin, not just worrying for his life, He's not just asking to get out of the mess. He's asking, what does he have to do to be saved? And his response to Paul and Silas is um, his concurrence with, with their response to his plea, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Because that's what he was talking about. And that crisis experience where he goes from trauma and real difficulty to peace, you can see him sitting, cleaning their wounds later on. There's a different man, a man with a sword ready to kill himself. And a few hours later, he's washing. I mean, a hard, hard, hard man. You think of that. And there he is cleaning these men's wounds later on. Still the same person. 
God has done a great work in his heart. Isn't that amazing? But you know, the crisis experience, not everyone can relate to it. Sometimes people are used, sometimes of awakening. I remember reading of Jonathan Edwards, same, around the same time as, uh, at the same time as George Whitfield. And one woman, I remember reading of her, but she'd be, the way the preaching of, was so powerful, she'd be, she was holding on to the, in the seat beside, she was holding on to the pillar. So powerful, she thought she thought she was going, you know. And uh, he had all well, the sermons that um, George would, um, Jonathan Edwards. You think you may be the one you've heard of as sinners in the hands of an angry God. And some of these fearful things, I mean, that, that's you know, just in, in, in that respect. Um, but that faith that shows itself, there can be crisis, conviction of sin. And you can be in church, you can believe and get relieved. Well, the Lord gives you that experience, a wonderful thing. And sometimes people you haven't been going to church, come into church and they're saved. Other people, it's maybe they used to, they were brought up in it and it takes a long time. And there can be so many different reasons. But what we're trying to say is if someone's maybe grows up in church and have always been in church and under the gospel, they're the kind of people we might have always thought were Christians before they were converted even. And they themselves might not be able to tell the difference. So they might not know, well, what, what's this justifying faith all about? Is it something that I meet with and go through and become like, um, like um, Bunyan's Christian? Do I come to the cross and my burden falls away? Well, some people, that is the way it goes. And you can look back at your conversion and it can be clear. Others, they maybe don't know the difference. Remember an elder in Stornoway, it was Willie Murray, he was called. He, he would say that. And one of the most loving, I mean, he always read John 15 in the Saturday night prayer meetings. Love was really, you know, it was, it was before the troubles really, as it were, kicked off in the late 90s and that. But um, no, he didn't know when he was converted. He couldn't tell you when he was converted or how. But you'd be in the company as, uh, of, of such great people, and it doesn't take you very long before you realize it's when you're in the presence of greatness. But, um, you know, either way, for you and for me, that faith with which or by which we initially embrace Jesus Christ, freely offered to us in the gospel, that remains our whole life, doesn't it? And maybe spending our life feeling we're losing our grip on him sometimes. But um, how it happened with Abraham, this is what we're trying to say, that the, the presence of that faith that justifies it, showing itself in Abraham, particularly when God is bringing him into impossible situations. And it's in the impossible situations that he is declared to be righteous because he believes what God is saying. And he embraces what God is promising. You think of it for a, for a moment. Where the, the argument goes up from verse 16 and following. Particularly it's, it's in verse 17. I mean Abraham is faced with God's promise that is going against everything. I mean Abraham and Sarah are biologically and in their age. And it's impossible and God is bringing Abram into a situation where he's saying, you're going to have a son. And through that son, all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Abram believes that. And that, that's amazing. It's shockingly amazing. But then you maybe wonder when, when you see him a little bit later on, when he's tested in this and he's tested in that. It's faith in the same promise over and over again, ultimately in Isaac and the sacrifice. But doesn't he take these steps so majestically by God's grace? saying to the servants who help them on the journey that we'll be back in three days. Hebrews 11 explains that, that uh, there's a very real sense in which Abraham received Isaac back from the dead figuratively. He had killed him. He had offered him. He had given everything to God. This is, I think, where, where the justifying faith shows itself. God bringing our, our lives or maybe arranging, maybe our lives or, or maybe part, part of your life, with circumstances that you know are impossible. And it doesn't maybe at, well, naturally it doesn't seem fair because it's impossible. And 
that can maybe make us wonder about ourselves and maybe make us wonder about what God might be saying to us or not saying to someone else who's maybe got things easier. Um, but everyone has their thing. Everyone has what the Lord knows they need. I mean, Abraham was made of really tough stuff. He was able to take things, but he could go so far. He's human. There's another, I mean, how do you think, for example, and they're reading between the lines maybe, but what we know of Sarah, for example, her reaction, natural reaction, you might say, apart from the fact that she overheard it from angels, that she was going to be, she was going to be a mother in, a, in, a, in about a year from, she'd, be, she'd have her own son, and she laughed. Imagine Abraham tried to explain what God had told her about going to offer Isaac. See, the way, and that's reading between the lines, but you can see Abraham, he's, he's gone through so much with God. Rather, God has brought him through so much and been with him in so much in the, the life of faith. And hearing from God has been so obvious to him that he knows when the Lord's speaking to him, that when he hears that voice, he knows. There's no question. Doesn't make sense. Why sacrifice my son? I have no idea. God is telling me I'm going to do it. But I know God has promised that through this son I'm about to sacrifice who God wants me to kill. Miracles are going to happen. All the nations of the world are going to be blessed. But I'm going to give him to the Lord. The Lord will raise him. That's how his faith, faith has a logic all of its own. That seems illogical. Kill your son. The one in whom all the problems. You could hear Sarah would be going, you know, anyone rationally, not just Sarah, I don't mean just Sarah, but you'd be trying to reason with him. It's amazing that Isaac doesn't. But he's come to that place of such implicit faith and dependence on God that he knows it's all going to work out. Isn't that amazing that he, he believes, verse 17, in the God who gives life to the dead and calls into existence things that do not exist. And he brings us maybe to these places to say, do you actually believe that I can do this? And that's not an easy thing to answer because we're maybe not able to work through things or live through things quite like Abraham. Abraham was someone who, I think the argument is that, you know, he would have nothing, can we say it, we wouldn't have a leg to stand on if it was based on his works. What we know about Abraham, we know very little of Abraham's flaws. What God has revealed to us, we know he had flaws. He was human like the rest of us. And um, were it all going to be based on Abraham's goodness, the fact that he's failed shows it couldn't, his acceptance couldn't be. Uh, accomplished, it wouldn't be complete. It is when the Lord revealed himself to Abraham, showed himself as the one Abraham needs, the one who has to follow, the one who will give him the, the salvation and the future and the inheritance. I mean, imagine Abraham wandering through a place. That he, we, to, the extent to which God called on him to believe and the power of his faith, the faith that God gave that man. Hebrews 11 is a phenomenal read in its own right that absolutely nothing of what God promised Abraham existed. Nothing. God called him to leave his family from out of the Chaldees, and he follows him by faith, not having a clue. Imagine if people would look and we think they have a word or two to say about Noah building this big boat. What about Abraham leaving everyone? Abraham, where are you going? I don't know. Why are you going? God's told me. You know, people think of your Christian life like that in a way. They think, what on earth has happened to you? What's got into you? Why are you thinking like that? He did not weaken in faith. <laughs> he did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. What happens when we start reasoning? The problem gets bigger, doesn't it? 
the situation becomes more impossible. So does that mean we imagine it's not there or don't think about it? Definitely not. It's like he had on one, the one hand the deadness of his own body and the barrenness of Sarah's womb. He had on the one hand and on the other it was faith in the God who he says uh, calls into existence the things that do not exist. And rather than the impossibilities swallow up his faith, it's the other way around. Not only that, that Paul seems, I think, to be saying to us that he didn't waver, he didn't question, he didn't flinch. The more he thought about it, when he thought about his body, it didn't make him, it didn't make his heart sink or think, how, it, none of that. The faith was so strong, which isn't to commend Abraham, don't mean that, but it's, it's commending God's grace, isn't it? What's possible for you, what's possible for me, no matter how impossible the circumstances are, if it's people or things or how immovable or, you know what, it might even be the whole, your life, memories, anything, thing, anything at all that's, that's weighing you down and that's, that's impossible. You know this, it's impossible and you feel maybe like giving up about it. All these things happened. The Lord gave the parable of the persistent widow. He told us these words so that we would keep praying and not lose heart. Yeah, it's easy to give up or, or to want to give up in, in a certain area. But maybe the Lord's one to remind us that that's not what he wants. He doesn't want us to, to kind of give up in any situation. He wants us, I think, to maybe kind of let go of it. Not butting our heads in the sand or pretend it isn't there or, or lessening it or anything. But just completely letting go of it. And not allowing even the burden or the problem to get in the way of looking after yourself. In the sense that the Lord wants us to be the best that we can be for him. And sometimes being overburdened with other burdens, which, which isn't a criticism, is something that might get in our own way spiritually, might make us not as useful. What I'm trying to say, um, remember the time, I wasn't planning saying any of this, but the time um, the Lord came down from the Mount of Transfiguration with uh, Peter, James, and John, and the rest of the disciples were there, and there was a desperate father, and this child was desperately afflicted, and, and the disciples couldn't help and the Lord explained, this kind doesn't go out but by prayer and fasting. They were trying to cast the demon out, weren't they? The Lord is saying, there's some like this where you just got to stand back and just keep praying and wait for me to do it. The question we have isn't what Abraham had. Abraham had the promise, didn't he? And so with the promise... We'd probably still doubt massively. David did the promise of being king. He still fled to Achish and Gath with Goliath's sword, which was unreasonable. But there's, there's the sense where Abraham, Abraham did not once doubt in the possibility of what God could do in his life. He didn't doubt once. And maybe you feel, and it's like, well, you know, this isn't going to change, though. Well, we don't know. God can do miracles, and the change might be with us before anyone else. See, Abraham, you know, to reach that point with him and to sit and to know God so clearly, to be so convinced of the reality of God, 
in life from day to day, that there's no question that he is able to do exactly what he has promised. And not to let, but will he do it for me, come into it. Don't let that come into it. That'll hinder faith. Because in it, we're not saying, but will you do it for me? Say, Lord, I know you can if you will. And if we can leave ourselves, in a sense, aside because it's all of grace. We're trying to say, we're trying to notice and to, and, and to embrace that we're never going to be good enough for anything, for the Lord to do anything. And he will respond to the least attempt we try. Doesn't he so often? He'll take the will for the deed, they say. But... Um, To be in that clarity of knowing and that certainty of believing that he is able to do whatever he's saying, irrespective, this is the thing we're trying to say, of how we feel, irrespective of any feelings of guilt or shame or unworthiness. Just remember the way Abraham prayed for his nephew just a bit before where we're reading, and a bit later where we see in, in Genesis, he's praying for Abraham. Abraham's praying for Lot. He's praying for the righteous in the city. And there's a man of great hesitation. There's the man who's been justified. But there's the man who knows God. He said, he knows God enough that if I pray and ask God to save the city, to spare a city for 10 righteous people, I know God will do it. Because that's his character. And he was so daring and so bold to do that. And we're thankful the Lord actually answered. Not in the way of sparing the cities, but in the way, of course, of destroying them. Because there wasn't even that number of righteous people to be present. Well, the Lord help us, friends. We think about the challenges the ups and downs, but to continue and persevere in faith. Let's pray just now. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, our God, you are the living and you are the true God. You are the high, you are the lofty one. You inhabit eternity. Your name is holy. There is no one in heaven who may once compare themselves with you. And even... Uh, the very angels are as nothing in your sight. But Lord, our God, tonight we pray that with Abraham we may be able, all of us, to, to follow and persevere and to know that liberty, freedom, and even that buoyancy in life of trusting you when nothing makes sense. Do you remember as well you've said that when we pass through the waters, you will be with us, and the fire will not kindle on us. And it's at these moments to recognize and to be still and know that you are God. Bless our people, Lord, who need you, where there's old age and illness and tests and so much happening. We pray for your blessing and healing and restoration. Remember us in these times. Remember our homes and families. Hear our prayers. Forgive our sins, we ask, as everything we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some verses from Psalm 106, 106. Scottish Psalter, it's page uh, 378. Psalm 106, verses 1 to 5. Give praise and thanks unto the Lord, for bountiful is he. His tender mercy doth endure. Yeah. Unto eternity, God's mighty works, who can express or show forth all his praise? Blessed are they that judgment keep and justly do always. Let's sing down to verse uh, 5 from Psalm 106. Oh, my dear. 
conclude. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.